Hey, Toby. Hey. <laughs> Welcome to another Jamcast. To <laughs> How are things in, uh, in London? They're fine. They're fine. They're fine. But uh, the cat has shown up early. So well, the, you know, the cat's to fight uh, him off. got to be fed. The, well, the cat has been fed. This is post-feeding time, but I don't know what this complaint is currently about. <laughs> things are fine. How are you in your uh, isolation? Um, I am getting a little stir crazy as everybody else would be by now. Um, I know that at least one other member of the apartment complex here has COVID-19 and, um, and life so is full of upstairs and, and lick their door. Yeah, exactly. I'm not that, I'm not ready to do that just yet. Um, no, actually I'm a little, I'm quite worried about, about it because, you know, I saw them some weeks ago, they've been in the common parts. Uh, they've now isolated themselves, but, uh, you know, you have to sort of assume that, uh, anything, anything they've touched or breathed on is dangerous. Um, and I feel for them, you know, it's not a nice situation. I mean, they had it, they had it pretty bad for a while. They're young as well. Um, but, uh, it, they presented a kind of interesting moral quandary, which was that the, I said to them, well, you know, you better tell the building. And they were afraid to, because they said, you know, they heard of another person they knew who, who was of Chinese descent, who was uh, attacked with hate mail and all sorts of stuff in their building when they mentioned it. So, oh lord, I know. I said, look, I I hear you, and I I can imagine it's it's a miserable situation to be in. But you know, we're all supposed mm. to think of the community right now, right? And there's probably a way to 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 get the news out without freaking people out, just so that now you know people who come into the building can be extra careful, as they should be, but. To be honest, a lot of people yeah. aren't being. I can see them kind of walking around lackadaisically. So I did think it was important. And and uh, I just think that these times, they just bring out, you know, different sides of our characters. Uh, and so, yes. you know, that that reminds me of some of the discussions we had. In fact, let me see, you know, uh, we're, these are some we have some issues that we're going to talk about later, but I'm going to put them on the table just while we're talking because we have this one about, you know, what if community is more important than the individual? So that's sort of relevant to that issue. And also this idea of what if friends are more dangerous than, than strangers is the assumption um, because they won't tell us things that we need to know because they're afraid mm. of. They won't that we won't be their friends anymore or something, you know, bad will come of that. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, these are interesting moral quandaries. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it uh, presents uh, these are trying times and they present some trying situations and people's real characters, I guess, come out. Um, but first, I suppose that I should probably, um, you know, uh, give a word to to our sponsors. Um, this podcast is brought to you by Trump Cruises. Uh, you bring the lime, we bring the Corona. Very um, nice. And there's 200, let's see, what is it? 257,000 customers and counting as of today. Oh, 215, excuse me, 215, 362,000 customers and counting. So okay. um, we're, we're doing That's well in the, in the, in the, <laughs> in the Trump. Well, it's a big country. Um, and, uh, and a lot of people, yes, are, uh, are getting it. Anyway, thanks for that. Um, There's not so, enough teas on that boat. The boat should be covered in teas. That's in teas, if I know yeah. anything about Trump. It's gold That's teas. Right. It would be yeah. gold and covered in the letter T. Oh, in fact, the whole boat would be gold, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yes, yeah. the boat would be gold. Yeah. Gold, faux gold marble, if that's possible. If you crossed yes. marble and gold together, you'd get gold with a kind yep. of a marbling uh, effect on it. Nice. Um, Very nice. So... What I was um, hoping to do today was to kind of go over some of the things we've done in the past few Jamcasts okay. and put it all together into, into some coherent whole, if I can. Mm -hmm. um, you recall that, that we sort of have this pitch jam that we are leading up towards where we have these different things listed, like a title, genre, Germanic question, et cetera, what you see on the screen. Mm -hmm. and, and that should give us a pretty good story concept to take forward. Um, and the story message, which is the last item on that um, screen, is kind of what we start off with in our effort to create a pitch. And, and this is different from the way most people do it, because 
uh, in this sense, without plot, without characters, any of this business, we're trying to figure out essentially what is the story about? What's the meaning of it? Before we begin doing those other things. So we spend a fair amount of time kind of going in search of a story message. So today I wanted to break that down a little further. Um, and I don't want to do that screen. No, I want to do this screen instead. Why can't I have this screen? Excuse me. I'm having a moment. Uh, why want I, I want that one? I want that one. There we go. So picking up where I last let it fall off. So mm -hmm. if we look at uh, the components of the pitch jam, uh, the story message is sort of at the end, but the story message is really um, like a, uh, let me start again. Okay, so the pitch jam could be looked at almost as if you had a moral argument plus those other things. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, like a moral argument and everything else. And the moral argument is what you use to create the story message. So it's really like saying you've got this proto story message and then all this other stuff that you add to it. And um, what we're then doing obviously is trying to hone in on what what the story is about. And if I look at the story message and how we define it, we've been saying that it's this sort of universal truth that is confirmed or contradicted. And down below there is, the, is this idea of a dramatic question, a premise, and a moral argument being kind of wrapped into one, and that's our story message. So if you imagine if we had the story message written on a separate sheet of paper, it would have a dramatic question, it would have a premise, and have a moral argument. And that's what we would take forward to kind of into our pitch jam. Um, then we have uh, this progression. How do we get to the? How do we get to this uh, moral argument? Well, we start off in the first phase, going through topics and working out issues and resolutions and debates, and eventually coming up with this moral argument. And then we take that moral argument into the pitch jam and that eventually becomes our story message. So I know it's a little bit of information, sorry for the long lecture, but I want to kind of uh, give you the sense of how it all builds and builds and builds towards this pitch. Now you recall before we talked about a moral argument being this sort of vice virtue couplet where we have some kind of conflict and we can make this point by saying that it's a, a vice that leads to something horrible, but there's some moral virtue that reconciles it to something better. And that's how we want to try to express our moral arguments. Um, so looking at it uh, from this perspective, a argu moral argument is these three things, the dramatic question of premise and this vice virtue couplet. And here's an example of what that might look like. So we might start off with the dramatic question that says, what if your lover became your enemy? And we might choose a premise from a list of other choices that familiarity breeds contempt because that seems like it might go well together. And the story message might end up coming out something like this, don't confuse intensity with intimacy and so on and so forth, you could read that. But the idea is that we start off with things that are kind of general and we make them more and more specific as time goes on. And the moral argument that led to that story message might look a little different. Let's see if I have a slide that, uh, that sh well, I, I thought it's like missing a slide, man. What happened to my slide that talks about the, that gives a proto example? Oh, well, picking up from there. Um, what you will notice is that our dramatic questions are kind of like our issues. You know, when we did those issue jams and resolution jams, because those questions that we create as issues could be framed as what if questions. And those resolutions that we come up with could sort of be premises that are fleshed out. So I think that's what we kind of want to, to use going forward and building upon uh, those different steps. So if I go back to um, the table for a moment, we have issues and resolutions that we've created in the past. And there's a bunch of topics. I mean, we don't have to d discuss them initially, but I'll just put them out there so you can see what some of them were uh, for, for fun because they could influence some of our discussion. But we had things like dis disaster magnet, weaponized nostalgia, crisis cleansing, 
the sharing economy, uh, social distancing, which is, of course, very appropriate to now. Um, we had herd immunity, um, which came up from all this coronavirus stuff. We talked about um, ruin porn. I don't know where that goes. <laughs> That's somewhere over here. Um, and then, I don't know, just for the hell of it today, I thought I'd introduce um, Zoom bombing, because this happened to me recently. I don't know if this happened to you, but uh, I was no. I was told that people have been sort of hijacking Zoom calls that are not password protected. Um, and people are having all these <laughs> Zoom meetings, you know. So I go online to this performance, um, and... Uh, all these people are watching this live performance and suddenly there's porn and I can see, you know, the screen of the MC hastily trying to find out who is the person is pushing porn into the main screen and get rid of them. And so they do. Wow. Then we go back to the performance okay. and then they show up again under another name and they start mooning us with their bare bottom and all this stuff. And it's like, I mean, so, so this is zoom bomb. Hey, it's and, art, and it, man. <laughs> and, uh, I guess it's, you know, it can happen in many different ways. Some people get, uh, you know, porn, some people get something else. Uh, so they're sort of like hijacking zoom. But anyway, that's a new phenomenon happening at the moment. So okay. I know I've bombarded us with all this stuff up front. And I think, you know, I went through it quickly so that we can step through it and freeze the frame if we want to look at it in more detail later. But essentially these are sort of issues and resolutions that we kind of create. They help us lead to this moral, moral argument and these issues can be reframed as what if dramatic questions and these resolutions can be reformed as premises. So that's how we can take the work that we've done before and, and, and forward into this construct. I'm going to put out a few of resolutions that we've discussed in recent Jamcasts. So let's see, I'm going to make this so you can read it. So these issues, for example, what if the community more important than the individual? What if friends were more dangerous than strangers? And what if your life became your job? That was an interesting one that we actually did a little proto pitch around. So for resolutions, um, I'm gonna start off with, this one is a, familiar to us as a premise. We've used this premise before, good fences make good neighbors. Um, then, so, I, so I've actually written these out as if they're premises in a way because I want to push us in that direction. But of course, we can rewrite things if we think that they don't quite say what we want to say. Um, maybe we can look at this one too. Sometimes we pay the most for that which we get for free. Um, another one that I thought could be interesting and we're running out of space is, let's see, history repeats itself when we live in the moment. Um, and then this one was from the other last time was apocalypse provides opportunity. I have in crisis, but we probably don't need that because I say yep. pro apocalypse nope. provides opportunity. So I will yes. do that because it's kind of obvious. Um, oh, I've got this. I've got the shouty guy. Don't know if you can yep, hear him. Can, yeah. yeah, shouty I man. I, I was actually worried about shouty man because I haven't seen him in a couple months. And I thought, well, maybe maybe Corona got him. But but thankfully not. Shouty Man's interesting because he is uh, well-dressed and well-coiffed, so he can take care of himself or someone else takes care of him. And he basically walks around the neighborhood shouting at the top of his lungs obscenities that uh, you know, wrath is coming and that type of thing. And he has amazing energy because he could do this for hours. And I can hear him walking slowly off in the distance, as you probably will during this Jamcast. He will give us a background. Um, facts are enemies of the truth. And I got a couple of others, but I'm going to hold them back in case we need them. So what is it we want to do today? Well, I wanted to, um, I wanted just to look at, let's see, where, where is the, hang on a second. I got to get my slide up. I'm going to have to edit this. I can see I'm going to edit this. So if I go back to our example, that's not supposed to say story and message. That's why it's supposed to say something else. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Picking up where we left off, I was hoping that we could 
take our issues, find a good dramatic what if question, take our resolutions as premises, and then create this vice virtue couplet of some kind as a moral argument so that we'd have a nice little moral argument at the end of it. So we did look at um, an example, which I guess I will put up there on the screen one more time, saying, you know, here's what we might come up with. And I don't think we should say story message at this case. That's sort of a typo. We should sort of say this is a, we're looking at a moral argument at the moment. And that's a little wordy compared to what we're going to come up with. And I don't know where my example disappeared to, but uh, we'll okay. use our imagination. All right. So looking at this, it's a lot of information. Mm -hmm. And I guess sitting, just sitting back, first blush, does anything jump out at you or interest you from any of the stuff that we have on the table? I mean, I talked about how this is relevant to what's happening to me right now and my neighbor not wanting to right. uh, come clean about something that could potentially kill people uh, around around the neighbor. I won't say what gender the neighbor is so that this doesn't uh, uh, limit the uh, possibilities. I'm protecting right. the neighbor's uh, uh, identity That's for the moment because, um, you know, I, we live in difficult times. Um, Zoom bombing, uh, I don't know how, I don't know if that works with anything. What if your life became your job? I don't know if uh, if Zoom bombing could somehow be part of your life's work. You just actually well, said when you said a performance that. artist, you know. Mm. I mean, it, it, I mean, I was it, just trying it, to think if it, if, it, if it ties in with what if friends are more dangerous than strangers. So uh, the, let's imagine an invasion of the body snatchers type scenario where you're talking to a bunch of people and someone comes onto the Zoom conversation and addresses you, someone who you've never seen before, and says, don't trust any of these people. They're not who they seem to be. And is this... Uh, and okay. they're, of course, going, oh, it's a Zoom. This is a Zoom bombing guy. <laughs> this is this is crazy. <laughs> Get rid of them. This is stupid. And the person saying... But it plants the a Things scene. that Actually, maybe only the person himself would know, yes. You know, okay... I, before you said this, I was imagining somebody who, as a performance artist, uh, did come into Zoom meetings uninvited and pretended to be invited, like get gate crashing, like you have party crashers or mm -hmm. whatever, gate crashing. Mm -hmm. You have a Zoom crasher who you know comes into meetings and it works best when they're part of meetings or people kind of like thinking someone else must have invited them. So they're you know, providing yes. really interesting insights. They're calling stuff out and people are thinking, wow, we really liked, you know, Gerald, Gerald's advice and their comments. Who is Gerald? And nobody knows who Gerald is and Gerald never shows up again. Mm -hmm. So it's like, uh, this is their, their life's work is this. But then well, but you made me think that it's almost like it's a prophet. You know, someone who comes in, changes, mm -hmm. turns your lives upside down and they do it through this sort of, um, their life work is uh, the medium, Zoom, the Zoom, medium of Zoom bombing. <laughs> Because we're all, or and it's also the perfect way of getting a, getting a meeting with a top executive you've always wanted to meet. If they're doing an unsecured Zoom thing, it's your chance to do an elevator pitch, as it were. And then you can show them your, your body parts as well. Your butt. Yep. <laughs> all right. They've been doing I, it to us for years, man. It's time to get our revenge. How do we? <laughs> Actually, yes. I mean, you you could zoom bomb knowingly something that you want to disrupt, and you know the participants, and you have uh, you're sort of like a um, uh, people hire you to to hijack and bomb the Zoom meetings to to get things out, you know, uh, news and information yeah. that others need to hear but don't want to. Um, okay, so we have. Zoom bombing floating around uh, in uh, in here. I just actually, I put it over this card, what if your life was your job, because I just thought as a profession, 
you know, professional Zoom bomber, <laughs> what that what that might well, look yeah, like. Yeah, I mean, it could be well, but well, you could imagine someone who'd lost their job in the in this epidemic, and because they need to pretend that they're working to their wife, they're Zoom bombing to these corporations. Someone who has too much that's time on their hands. the illusion of, hmm. mm. well, no, but the, they're meant to have a job. They've told their spouse they still have a job, so they're joining all these random Zoom calls to make it look like they've got a busy day of meetings. Mm. Secrets. And the as they're doing friends. that, they actually start making a difference with some of these companies. I wonder if I can... Uh somehow make crisis cleansing and zoom bombing go together because this is like a prophetic you know uh, apocalyptic information um actually let's just think about crisis cleansing for with this for a moment what if friends are more dangerous um there's a didn't we talk about ages ago this idea that at several stages in your life you should whittle down your friends because as you get older, there's just fewer relationships that you can really meaningfully have. And so it's like a spring cleaning. You spring clean your friends, like a, uh, like a Marie Kondo. I can't remember right. what it was. We yes. talked about that, didn't we? So, yes, we did. We did. So we maybe, did. There's, maybe this sort of pandemic or the apocalypse is a sort of crisis cleansing opportunity where you really kind of go through your your friend network and say, not you, but you and this and that. Oh yes, we did have this sort of almost like a reality TV show concept, didn't we? About, <laughs> about the friend spring cleaning. Um, yeah. but, um, which you say all your friends are gathered and then you have to eliminate them. But uh, this what is if, a little what different. If, so I'm positing a, mm. yeah, well, I'm positing a hypothetical future where, because we have all been exposed to so many viruses, um, that you have a finite amount of time you can spend with anyone because otherwise there's a chance that the, 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 the germs in you and them will have combined to form something truly apocalyptic. So they have decided you are not allowed more than six years of friendship. Hmm. Well, the, I think that what's interesting about the apocalypse in all this is unlike the spring cleaning friend spring cleaning thing that we talked about way in the past this is driven by a crisis it's not just someone saying oh i want to whittle things down it's that now they are dangerous as you're suggesting because of what they carry um mm. in fact i mean i've you know I, I i can see that people's relationships might be really strained because let's say that two people are friends or lovers, but, you know, one of them or both of them are around people that are immunocompromised or something of that nature. So they can't really be together properly. And that would put enormous strain right on their relationship because mm. there is a crisis. The crisis says, you know, y your friends are actually dangerous because when you're with them, you let your guard down, you, you, uh, kind of do you get you get too close right and um mm -hmm. and therefore uh you have to be wary but then of course the question is what is the opportunity that apocalypse brings so in that scenario you've got that uh, your friend is dangerous to your to your health and well-being or of someone close to you or or rather there's a hierarchy of closeness now because you are forced to choose between a family member and your mm -hmm. your lover or something right you know your partner mm -hmm. you know what do you do in that situation and that's going to create uh tension and fracture right um yes and so what is the opportunity that comes in that i wonder um hmm. no it's a fresh start it's 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 a chance to meet all new friends it's a chance to jettison relationships that maybe weren't working that well for you now you have an excuse well also what if you're someone that that what if you're somebody that doesn't like to get too close anyway and you've been conflicted because you hmm. really have gotten close to this person 
And normally, under regular circumstances, for most people, they would sort of welcome that and say, isn't this wonderful? But in this case, this person is feeling as if they're being consumed or subsumed or something. And so they have this terrible tension. But this apocalypse gives them a wonderful reason to distance and say, I don't, I can't be with you um, because you're mm -hmm. dangerous to me. And so really, the danger is an emotional danger, but they're using the physical viral danger as the the reason but it's just masking an underlying emotional danger instead right which is that hmm. i don't want to lose myself in this relationship um so th that's the mm -hmm. opportunity the apocalypse brings opportunity and actually just thinking about relationships for a moment i mean this i'm just taking it in that vein for just to try that out um <laughs> what hap what's the apocalypse provides opportunity in relationships um, you know, because I, I read that, uh, I mean, this might not be true, but it was a headline I saw that, uh, that, um, divorces in Wuhan and whatnot have gone up, uh, because of the, the strains and the isolation, the quarantine and stuff that people have been through. So, you know, when people are put to the crucible, do they grow closer together or do they drive themselves further apart? And... What kind of opportunities is there? Is there an apocalypse, um, Lothario, or uh, <laughs> um, you know Casanova? The apocalypse Casanova. Is there somebody who who you know really sees this as? Um, oh, and there, of course, the pickup line is: "This may be our last day on Earth, so why don't we?" Kind of Great. thing. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just gonna put mm -hmm. that out there. I mean, it's 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 sort of makes me think of the you know, what's the remember that Will Smith movie where you know he's helping people get you know get the it's sort of like Cyrano de Bergerac where he's sort of helping them get the the, the partner they want and he's giving mm -hmm. them all the sort of the the moves and the guidance and uh it sort of made me think of you know what would the opposite be like you know a breakup artist who helped people get out of relationships that they were too cowardly or or they they mm -hmm. felt too much weight and burden or responsibility to get out of and so the breakup artist concocts mm -hmm. these scenarios to help them break up and so they're hired as a con as a consultant you know sometimes they play mm -hmm. multiple roles you know like the like the lover from the past or some other role to create mischief or disruption so crisis cleansing, the apocalypse, maybe, you know, what kinds of opportunities arise in this situation? Except that that has already been a film. Oh, damn it. Every good idea has already been taken. What's the Sorry. film? It's called The Breakup Artist. Hmm. Competition that forces one. a woman who destroys, competition forces a woman who destroys relationships to become a matchmaker. Oh, okay. So this is like, well, Matchbreaker. American rom-com. It should yes. have been called The Matchbreaker, man. They missed an opportunity. It should have. That, okay. was a, that was a pitch I came up with ages ago. Yep. Mm. You see? Great minds think alike. They do. They do. <laughs> All right. So, um, I don't know. Apocalypse and Crisis uh, provides opportunity. Apocalypse provides opportunity. I still think there's something interesting to consider there. Um. This one here, facts are enemies of the truth. Uh, what do you think of when you hear that? What What is your interpretation of it? I can't figure that one out, actually. Because to me, the truth is facts. But, but are you talking about sort of our mythological truth that we live by and that therefore to have that punctured by facts... Hmm. <laughs> is I mean I suppose that's what I'm talking about is uh, that's my that's what I get from it is um you know when you have uh, all families have mythologies and it's that whole thing about you go to another family member and say do you remember this thing and they say no it wasn't like that at all um and whether that's because it's from a different person's point of view or whether it's we have these fragile mythological worlds that we carry around like little atlases 
and sometimes the facts damage them because our mythological worlds don't actually hold much sway. That's very poetic. I like that. I was thinking of a much less um, okay, more prosaic. I was thinking of a more prosaic okay. version, which was that I, I have for for decades held on to fond memories of Life of Brian. And I said to my yes. kids, oh, we've got to watch this. This is so funny. Because we did watch, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Holy Grail together. And uh, they, they thought that was hysterical. So I said, okay, great. Let's watch Life oh, of good. Brian. Oh, good. Well, they did. Okay. And, and we so. watched Life of Brian. And um, it's funny because it wasn't exactly as I remember it. And it was sort of less funny this time around because I think – you forget how irreverent and kind of shocking it was at the time and, and the mm. ideas that it put in front of you were really, you know, uh, juxtaposed in a very clever way. And now it sort mm. of seems, uh, you know, less so given given the time. But but also there, you know, there was, oh God, I can't remember it now. See, I blanked it from my memory. It's so bad. But I actually had this favorite scene in my mind and that scene wasn't no. in the movie. I realized that I had... No. Over the years of telling this, I had created a favorite scene that didn't exist. So, um, <laughs> and no one was, had corrected you about it. Well, yeah, because no other people, had, yeah, I don't remember this. Right? You know, wow, that's a great scene. I don't remember that one. No, so so that's a bit like you're saying this sort of fragile memory of reality. Um, mm. And in fact, I just sort of thought, as you're saying that, that that kind of brings into relief maybe this one that history repeats itself when we live in the moment. This idea that we have no history, our memory is quite false. We form these narratives about things. And so these, these kind of go together nicely in some way about, well, okay, what does this mean? Facts and enemies the truth. I, to be honest, I don't entirely know. It, it leapt off the page for me and I thought, oh, that's interesting. I want to noodle that one. After thinking about it a little bit, and, and I didn't search up the origin, so I don't know why this this okay. phrase was this idiom was created, but I sort of feel like that we have this notion that the truth is some inviolate thing, in, invaluable thing, that it's that it, there is the truth, and instead we kind of learn that hmm, you know, it's hard to say there is one truth because the truth is kind of underpinned by facts, and the facts are things that are hard to dispute when they should be. I mean, we talk about fake news and all this and that, but mm. facts should be hard to dispute. Therefore, the way that you assemble those facts and the perceptions that you create from that affects what is perceived truth. So it seems to be that truth is somewhat perceived. It's not something that we can objectify. And so we do create narratives, and like you were saying, certain myths about ourself and our environment and this and that. And that becomes our truth, Right. And whether that's based on facts or not is almost a different matter. And I think that's an interesting mm. conflict. And somehow these two seem relevant together. That, uh, you know, if we, if we create this notion of the truth, which is fashioned in the moment, and we ignore history, which are facts, let's say, even though I know history can be perceived in different mm -hmm. generations, in different ways. But for the moment, if we just say facts are like history in this couplet, then that's why I see these as being related. We, we generate these narratives all the time to frame what is happening to us. And sometimes they're just not based on fact. Um, but we take them as such. So that's kind of interesting. And apocalypse sort of disrupts that process maybe a little bit because we're kind of forced to reconsider things have you reconsidered anything in your life given what's happening now no no I, no I, I mean my life has changed very very little as a as a home-based freelancer um it, it's it's making me realize in a sense how lucky i am how much i enjoy it hmm. okay so it's something that you took for granted before and now mm -hmm. you feel uh, perhaps a little more secure. Yes, I was always going, oh, I wish I'd had an office job. Oh, I wish I had the security of that. But I think what this is showing is there is no such thing as security anymore. And you need to be happy with your own company. Hmm. That's a nice, yeah, that's a nice thought. I think that, um, I think also that um, 
history repeats itself when we live in the moment is relevant to now because there's all this talk about how now is unprecedented and unlike anything else. Hmm. And uh, I don't know if that's entirely true. Um, no, I think not. that, um, you know, this, the, the, the expression that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes is, you know, probably more accurate that, okay, the precise mm -hmm. circumstances are different, but human behavior is pretty predictable. And, you know, we've had calamities of various kinds. Sometimes it all happen at once. And so, you know, the behavior that we've seen, like hoarding or becoming fearful of neighbors, you know, all this stuff has happened before many times over. And why can't we, why can't we remember history? Why is that so difficult for us to go back to for guidance? Yeah, that's true. Well, that fits in with the facts or enemies of truth, doesn't it? Because we, we tell ourselves all of these false histories to support our view of the world. I've become really interested. And the problem is, hmm. go ahead. That's right. But the problem is, no matter how false they may be, we're, we'll find one other person on the internet who agrees with us. <laughs> well, that's the internet okay. wreaks wreaks havoc with uh, this one. The good fences make good neighbors because there's no fences in the internet. Anything goes, and you can reach anybody anywhere with anything. Um. Mm -hmm. It you know I so do bad fences make bad neighbors. <laughs> or do fences make the neighbors? If there's no fences, you have no neighbors. I mean, I was thinking, you well, know, if going. No, if you have no fences, everybody. No, everybody is your neighbor. Is the problem if you have no fences? Right. Right. Okay. Yes, this is the the global village which is an interesting idea, isn't it? Yes, I'm going to write that down the, to, to keep, keep track of that, the global village. It's hard to see that. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the, it's a little different, but it's related in this, this story message example I gave. I didn't read it out loud, but I was thinking about the good fences and good neighbors in this in this message. I concocted this message earlier today just to, for the purposes of, uh, of example. But this notion of confusing intensity with intimacy, I think this happens a lot with people where if they have a very intense relationship, they think it's intimate, but it's not necessarily. It's just intense. There's a difference. And so what I'm suggesting in this story message is that you might have an intense relationship where the objective object, the idea is to conquer the object of desire and enslave it somehow. And that's very different from creating a boundary and space for love to flourish. So I was trying to explore that contradiction that the boundary, putting boundaries in place allows for love because it allows for some space, some respect, some otherness, whereas you know, just trying to smash two souls together into one is sort of a power play in a way. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily lead to intimacy. It can actually lead to isolation. So that was stemmed from good fences make good neighbors, but I ended up taking the familiarity breeds contempt premise because I thought it made that stronger. You know, what if your lover became your enemy kind of thing? But, but I think that... Right. That that follows on to this and the idea that with, that having some boundaries uh, encourages better behavior, because if you keep reaching in without boundaries, you end up having you know power plays, right? So boundaries are sort of there to say you know mm, there's a certain point that you should certain distance you should respect. So social distancing, you know, right now we're maybe being asked to consider a lot more physical space between each other. And that may change, that may change for a long time. You know, what you were describing before we started this jam cast about how you've got to go into the store one at a time and have no more than five people in there at once. 
we're doing that here in some cases, not everywhere. I mean, I, I've, it's very spotty. I've gone to places that do that and other places where you just have people milling around with no protective gear mm. who, are, who are older, who seem to be completely uninterested, disinterested in what's happening. Um, but in general, if we keep having this problem flare up, we're going to have to think about good fences everywhere we go. Um, and what, what effect will that have on us socially or psychologically? I mean, maybe it's a good thing. So the, so the internet has, has boundary crossed a great deal. Um, and it is, that has created opportunities and has also created problems. So in terms of a, of a what if, I just wonder if we can, oh, I didn't, yeah, I didn't put these out there. I don't know. I was wondering if these, if any of these would spark something new from us. I think we've done the what if your life became your job a little bit. I, I, I'll put that aside because I yes. like what we did with that one. Um, but here's another hmm. one. Sorry, I, a yeah. sub, sub idea I just had about that is what if because you're having all these Zoom meetings, you have to create a fake life that you've told other people about that you don't actually have because you're showing people your home. Oh. So you're having to, because everyone else has got pets and they keep showing them off or they keep wandering off the screen, you've got to grab a pet off the street to do that so everyone will coo over your pet. And then because you've told people you've got an amazing boyfriend who you're, you're having to sequester yourself with, you've had to hire someone who's willing to show up in a hazmat suit and, and and serve you cocktails on the Zoom thing. Well, I was, I was thinking about Just so how... Just keep up the pretense. Well, I, likewise, I was thinking about how Facebook often becomes sort of um, humble bragging. And it's sort of like, mm -hmm. well, look at me and this, this wonderful life I have and the wonderful things I do and the wonderful friends that I have. So this is like Facebook Live just takes that to another dimension where people are now, with Zoom mm -hmm. meetings, they're almost like live streaming their home environment. And creating this. Well, sort this of is like, the thing. It's it's incredibly intimate, right? You're seeing you're seeing someone's home. You so they're kind of deciding what the the backdrop will look like from their own home, and they may mm. not have because it's most people's places are tiny. You may not have that privilege to be able to say your people are going to see everything about your life. So you, you and so you might be using green screens a lot to do all kinds of other environments yes, to say you know this exactly. is uh, this is I mean I. I, I, it was funny because there's a video that someone showed me. I didn't, I don't know, I don't know the URL, otherwise I'd show it to you, but it was, you know, yeah. some YouTube celebrity who was doing a satirical uh, kind of self quarantine video where they were in a pool in Los Angeles with a cocktail and they're saying, oh, this is so awful. You know, the bowling alley has broken down and there's too many leaves on the tennis court to play. And, Oh, I, I, I empathize with all of us who are going through these terribly hard times. You know, of course, it's a beautiful day and the pool is nice. And uh, um, so clearly, you know, people are experiencing this uh, moment in very different ways. And now that there are more Zoom meetings or live streams and, ca and live casting being done from people's homes, like interviews and whatnot, even on broadcast, mm -hmm. you do see people's homes. And some people have rather immodest abodes, you know, and you, you find yes. yourself thinking, gosh, you know, on a professor's salary, is that really what, uh, <laughs> you know, should you have all that, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we might become a little judgy because uh, of what we see, right? Um, or someone has, you know, Nazi paraphernalia behind them, you know, even if it's been trying to tuck out of the way, you might go. say, yeah. hmm, you know, what's going on here, right? So... Uh, it's, you're right. Being, in fact, um, someone told me in a call yesterday that sometimes what happens when they do these meetups is someone thinks they've muted the microphone, but they haven't, and they'll have a conversation like, "Well, is he out of jail yet?" And they want how much for the bond, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Or they'll hear conversations they shouldn't be hearing about, you know, arguments between uh, spouses or you know this right. kind of thing. So um, it opens up interesting. Uh, Opportunities in crisis. Uh, <laughs> okay, so yes, turning your life into a, a, a Facebook live experience, um, live streaming 
Well, live streaming. I mean, that's kind of what we talked about last then, time. Facts but... are enemies of the facts are enemies of the truth in that instance. Okay, facts are enemies you know, of the truth. The illusion that we try to maintain about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Oops, brought face to face with the reality. Yep. Now this is something well, that Trump. Let's pick one of them and go. Oh man. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's too many. Um, <laughs> All right, we've, we've, well, we started, we kind of worked this one, though. I feel as if, uh, mm -hmm. okay, well, we have, you know what? I'll simplify it. We do have these two things in ascendant. We've got friends being dangerous, your life becoming your job, facts, history, I don't know, apocalypse. I don't know. These things are still kind of in play, but we mm -hmm. have... We have to, I'm going to take this. We we didn't do anything with some this one, so I'm going to move that out of the way. Yep. Um, okay. So, can we think of a of a of a of a what if that gets to the heart of a little bit more of what we've been talking about? Um, let's see. Um, well, I mean, you're talking about you know. What if you had to pretend to be someone you're not, which is sort of what you're talking about, the, the false uh, pretense? Um, mm -hmm. uh, what if you had to pretend you... Yeah, this is... I mean, these two are both about pretending that to be someone that you're not. Um, mm. Now, there also could be um, in the in the apocalypse situation. Um, you know, we have you you know we've got, we've got that old one, the sort of you're given you know five days to live type of thing. But is there some variant on that that could be interesting? everyone around you is given five days to live. You are asymptomatic and you have given them all a terribly fatal disease and they all have five days to live and they know it's your fault. Mm. And you know it's your fault. Mm. But or do they tell you? Or do they keep it to themselves? Right, because it's a stealth thing. They've just realized that they have infected everybody in fact, okay. So do you, yeah, so do you tell them? Do you not tell them? That's good. Okay. What if you have infected your village, I'll say, just for now? What if you have infected your village? In fact... I don't know if this has been done, maybe it has been, but it's interesting that this disease hardly affects children. So you can imagine in a way that it's a disease that could kill all the adults and leave the children behind. So that's a you Star could, Trek episode. Yes. Oh, is it? Okay. Cause I'm just thinking just like what you said, just building on that a person discovers, oh shit, they've infected mm -hmm. the village. And in fact, it means that all the adults will be gone in a couple of weeks and the children will be left behind and they have to say their goodbyes and teach their children all they know before they disappear, which is a, okay, Star Trek episode, but uh, an interesting conundrum. Reminds me of, uh, what was it? North Fork, I think was the name of it, which was um, an indie film about a town that was about to be wiped out because a dam was being built and it was the last days of the town. And it was, you were, it was, uh, you were following in a picaresque way, these various families as they packed up their lives ready to go. Hmm. And the memories that they had and what they were taking with them and the things that they couldn't take with them and both real and in the mind. Huh. Maybe there's something with this here because 
you could have a kind of a detective thing where a person discovers that there is an illness in their community. And they're trying to go around and figure out, just like they would in a pandemic, like where, who has had contact, right? And follow it up and follow it up and go to all the leads. Mm -hmm. But what they don't realize is they're the one infecting everybody. So every time they follow up a lead, they just infect another person. And so in the end, they discover right. so that it's, they, it's are, a, it's a, they are patient it's a zero. It's being the murderer. Right? Yes. So, so, it's the, so they are patient zero. The and as they do that, they, and the, and the kind of is about the sort of history of repeating itself in a moment in a weird way because they didn't start from the beginning. They're working their way backwards and realizing that they are responsible for the okay. situation. That's interesting. And yeah. then, you know, what do they do? <laughs> and do they, you know, how do they come clean and what happens when, when uh, you know, um, it's kind of a, yeah, it's kind of a weird, interesting situation. So um, let me see, what could we do to, well, what if you have infected your village, I guess is an interesting way of putting it, but is there another way we could say that? Um, uh, your family. Okay, okay. I mean, that's, a, that's when it gets interesting to me is, you know, your family has a limited amount of time to live. Do you tell them? Do you tell someone that? Or like in every war movie, do you go, no, no, you're going to be fine, Timmy. Okay. Is it so... better for people not to know if it's, if it's a disease that's going to wipe you out instantly, very quick. You know that if you tell them, they're going to hate you for the next for for the remainder of their lives. But time is time is the essence keep it to yourself. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, well, this is so this actually takes in all of these things into account. So, you got what if your friends are more dangerous? What if you affected your yeah. village? But what if you created the pandemic? I mean, these are similar, but they're sort of okay, they're getting they're coming closer to something. And then I think um now that we've looked at this we have these two possibilities in a way, you know, um, good, good fences make good neighbors or history repeats itself when you live in the moment. You know, I think that's sort of like the, that sort of works if this kind of the detective thing where you're trying to piece together what happened and then you discover that you are angel heart or whatever. Yes, um, yes. Uh, so, okay, now in terms of conceiving of a moral argument of some kind. I want to see if we can figure out some little uh, virtue vice couplet here. So you just described a situation where you know you are responsible for this, this pandemic, but you have, you're conflicted about coming clean because coming clean probably means that you will be stoned to death before you can do the things you want to do. But uh, mm -hmm. if you l let everyone live with the lie, well, for, for those who survive, um, <laughs> yes. it could create other problems. I mean, it's sort of like, how do you, uh, so it is about, it's about, it's about honesty, secrets. Um, there is this idea of, you know, the sins of the fathers or something. Um, Okay, so history repeats itself when we live the moment now sounds a little more like what I'm getting at because you are trying to erase history by not letting people create it. You're not, you don't want them to know the truth. <laughs> um, and, there, and that is that truth comment again, yes. Uh, actually, there's another so one. Is it, you know, the truth, if, the, if the truth shall set you free then why can't lies set you free? Okay. Oh, this is all oh, right. Of course. This is eight. Uh, sorry. Um, I should actually go out and join that. This is eight o'clock. We're, uh, we're supposed to go on our doorstep and clap for the NHS. All right. Go clap. I'll be right I will, back. I'll... <laughs>
Ah, right. Sorry about that. No, it's great. Ridiculous. Yeah. When you think we should be, when you think we should be giving them proper protective clothing and yeah, clapping and is clapping is no, good for morale, but it, hmm. <laughs> don't do much else. But it's uh, every Thursday night now at eight. I forgot. So. I was ref I, I have something kind of coalescing, but I don't I need I don't yeah. need your help because I don't quite see exactly what it is. But it this this idea here, what if you have infected your village, seems to me very apropos to now because there are people who go to work sick, and they have various reasons for doing so. Right, some feel that they'd be fired if they didn't complete the work and they need, they need the job. Others, similarly, maybe it's not as desperate in terms of the money from the job, but they, you know, it's important to their careers or, so it's money or career or something or some combination thereof. And so they have, to, they feel like they must go to work knowing that they're sick, right? That's one sort of something that's happening now or minimizing, rationalizing that, even though they're sick, it's just, it's, it's nothing. It's just a cold. It's just a, it's something that'll pass and it's not something serious. It's not COVID-19, right? So they tell themselves these things and then they go and infect their village. In this case, their, their company. Um, mm -hmm. These things here, the history repeats itself. You live in the moment. And I like this sort of idea of the kind of, the, you know, the person who doesn't realize their patient zero type of thing. Although, you know, if you, know you've infected your village, you know you've infected your village, and that's an interesting crisis. But I was imagining a scenario where, you know, to take it a little bit one step away from where we are now, that there is some disease that is causing people like, like Alzheimer's to lose their memory, you know, little by little within this organization. Mm -hmm. And the, the person who, you know, came to work sick, they maybe you know, honestly thought, oh, it's just a cold. But by going to work sick, they are infecting people with this memory virus, which for some reason isn't affecting them. <laughs> so they are watching people lose all memory of institutional knowledge, right? So it's kind of like a metaphor for now where we have this lack of leadership because we can't remember things that we prepared for in the past or reasons why we had the European Union or, you know, why we had a stockpile of stuff during the Cold War or whatever. So it's like we've collectively been losing our memory. And so this person is sort of watching this happen. And they're maybe they're trying to get to the bottom of it. And then they realize, oh, you know, I've created this problem because, you know, I haven't <laughs> haven't been honest or straightforward about my own circumstances or something. So I was trying to see it. There was some way to bring that together, but, um, maybe not, but I, but I, 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 I want, I see if I can build on, on this somehow in a, in a vice virtue couplet. Um, it often seems like, you know, um, uh, Okay, let me see if I can do, let me see if I can work this out. This is mm -hmm. this is an idea that pops into my mind, and and so if I start off with uh, let me get myself some space here. If I start off with this thing where I say um, the cruelest lies are told in silence, but uh, the truth shall set you free, which is something you brought up. This uh, is a starting point, right? It, we, we don't have to come up with a story message right now, but we can, mm -hmm. you know, nudge our way there with some kind of moral argument, which this, I think, would be a moral argument, um, saying that, you know, silence and you know and and, and truth uh in this way are are antithesis to each other so this is the person the reason they've infected the village is because they've been silent when they've known something 
maybe not thought through the full consequences, ramifications of it, but they've known something. Mm -hmm. And so that's the cruelest, you know, if, and, and the lie may be that they have rationalized it or, or done something to, yeah. to, uh, Apollo, you know, put, push it away without saying to people, you know, oh, this is, this is something that, that affects your life. And uh, so they've remained quiet. So that's the, that's the cruel lie told in silence. Um, however, the truth shall set them free. So, I mean, we could, we could put it, leave it there, but I wonder if there's anything else that kind of transpires from that. You know, if we could shade it a little differently. Hmm. I'm just making a note to myself about the erasing of institutional memory. No, I think that's I think that's a good that's a that's a good moral argument. Okay. It's interesting because the truth, um, if, if I could try to tie these together better, it would be something about the truth being kind of like a collective memory, and history being a collective memory, and somehow. Uh, when we obliterate that, we, you know, it's like we infect ourselves. I mean, this could be metaphorical. We infect ourselves with lies, right? This puts this all together. Mm -hmm. um, so, or you inoculate yourself mm -hmm. with lies. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes lies are necessary to inoculate against the truth. Yeah, I mean, that's very sinister, and that's what people would tell themselves to justify their behavior. This is like the, you can't handle the truth. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, you know, what's his name in the uh, Jack Nicholson? Uh, mm -hmm. Right. A like, you know, men. Yep. Li yeah, a few good men. There we go. Lies are, lies are, are necessary to... To social order, you know, people don't want to know. Um, hmm. Okay, I, I, I feel like we've kind of come. We've, we've we've done a good mental push there. We'll probably leave it there. But I would say that that I'm going to I'm going to take these these things and keep them together mm -hmm. as a as a unit because we could mm -hmm. we could flesh it out and ponder it. What I might do is. Because we do these jams, and then I sometimes go back and t noodle and tweak something, and so we can mm -hmm. think about how that might come about in several other versions of this sort of moral argument, mm -hmm. um, or this moral argument, uh, and uh, and come up with variations. Mm. All right, thank you very much. That is the moral. Thank argument you very much, jam. sir. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao.